Hello there, and welcome back to the booth here in Milwaukee. Ian, doesn't get much better than this. This oh, is yeah. a special match. This is 25 Pro Tour top eights going at it down in the feature match area. It's time for our second quarterfinal match. John Finkel versus Paulo Vitor Damodarosa. Hello and welcome to coverage of Pro Tour Battle for Zendikar. I'm Marshall Seikliff in the booth with R&D insider Ian Duke. And Ian, this is a special day and this is a special match. We have two of the best players ever to play Magic, two of the most stacked resumes in the history of the game. Paulo Vitor Damatorosa is somehow the underdog in the resume fight here <laughs> between these two players. You take a look at Paulo from Brazil, his opponent, that's John Finkel. He's a legend of the game. He's one of the best players. Uh, ma many people will call him the flat-out best Magic player in the history of the game. This is 10 Pro Tour top eights on the left side of your screen, 15 on the right. And we get to watch them play a quarterfinal match here to see who wins. Paulo's down a card here as he had to go down to six. Now, let's talk about their decks here. What tools have these two players brought to the table for this epic match? Yeah, so we just saw their deck lists um, in the, sort of the, the, the pre-game preview there. Uh, but Paulo Vita Damodorosa is on a Tarka Red, pretty standard, you know, red deck win style deck, but with this combo finish that we've seen from cards like Become Immense and Teamer Battle Rage. On the other side, John Finkel playing one of the breakout decks of this tournament, Dark Jess Guy. This is you know, Jeskai Mantis Rider deck adding black for cards like Crackling Doom and Kolagon's Command. All right, this should be a fantastic match to watch here. Now, it might go by quickly as the Atarka Red deck tends to win very quickly, or if it doesn't, kind of falls behind quickly, too. Yeah, and the Dark Jeskai deck is well stocked with cheap removal, like the Fiery Impulse that we saw there. That's huge from John Finkel. Uh, cards like Kolagon's Command can really grind out the game, uh, and they're, they're pretty efficient, too. And with uh, Paulo down a card from a mulligan, sitting on a couple more lands in hand in a teamer battle rage, all he's got to add pressure to the board is Monastery Swift Spear. So John Finkel in a pretty good spot coming out of the early game here. Now, you really hope against these Atarka Red decks that uh, they don't just curve out, you know, one drop, one drop, one drop, uh, and set you behind early on, especially since uh, Paulo is on the was on the play, right? John Finkel played in the first Pro Tour. Period. Now mm -hmm. he's in the juniors. The very first. Pro yeah, but he was in Pro Tour one. Still at it. Life has taken him a few other directions in between. But magic has always been a big part of it for John. Soulfire Grandmaster, the draw for John Finkel. This is a card we've seen do a tremendous amount of work throughout the Swiss, uh, but it looks like John Finkel opting to be mana efficient, just leaves up three mana for a Crackling Doom, which threatens to take out Paulo's only creature for the moment. Yeah, the and Paulo this turn, here. I think just a forest off the top for Paulo, so he is very heavily flooded by the standards of this Atarka Red deck. How much um, mana does this deck want? Three, like three, two, maybe three, maybe four, four by the time you're ready to... You want like three mana until turn five and maybe you hit your fourth on turn five, something like that. And there's that Crackling Doom that you mentioned a second ago, Ian, putting John Finkel to an even safer board state. I see he's also got a Mantis Rider at the top of his hand there. So this is just a, a dream sequence for John in terms of how this game's playing out. He's able to answer Paulo's early threats. Paulo's flooded out. John's able to get Mantis Rider on the table, which is bigger than any of Paulo's creatures. So now even if Paulo top decks something like a Monastery Swift Spear or Lightning Berserker, uh, it still doesn't get through the Mantis Rider without assistance. Yeah, don't blink here. This game could be over very quickly as Paulo has found himself with no threats whatsoever. A couple of lands and a team or battle rage in hand. And, uh, you know, one thing about cards like Manus Riders, they turn the tables on your opponent really quickly and the thing will just close out the game. 
Yeah, and the three toughness is awesome against these red decks. A three toughness vigilant creature is a, a great blocker as well because uh, very few of the red decks creatures can get through the Mantis Rider without assistance from another card. So Mantis Rider often attacks for three and then it blocks and trades for two cards. Or, in this case, just keeps on attacking for three. Yeah, that attack right there sent Finkel ahead in the damage race as well as Paulo's down to 11 life. Finkel's going to fall to 13 after a fetch land here, but it's it's looking like Paulo doesn't have any way to get that big finish. Now, you mentioned the sort of combo finish that Paulo has the ability to assemble. Why don't you talk to us about that? So what Paulo wants to do is start off the game with a couple early aggressive creatures like Zergo Bellstriker and Monastery Swift Spear, and then by the mid-game, he wants to set up for a Delve to become immense, which is a 5G Delve card. You can remove cards from your graveyard to help pay for it, and it gives a creature plus six, plus six. So for just one or two mana, you give a creature plus six, plus six, followed up with Teamer Battle Rage, giving it Double Strike and Trample for another two mana. So for three or four mana, you can effectively give a creature plus 12, plus 12, and even more if it's uh, a prowess creature like a Monastery of Swift Spear or an Abbot of Carol Keep. With Trample, too. Yes. You see John kind of shaking his head, but don't be fooled here. This game is basically in the books. John Finkel is way ahead. He's just resolved a dig through time on top of being ahead on board, being ahead on cards, and being ahead on the damage race as well. It is all John Finkel here in game one as Paulo mulligan to six and just has not had the draw that he needed to get there now. You know, as, as we start to look forward towards the end of the game here, uh, you know, Paulo has now fallen down all the way to six. Um, one of the questions I have is about who's supposed to win game one and who's supposed to win the sideboard games. And, yeah, that crackling doom on the stack right there finishes it off. So John Finkel, with a quick game one, dispatches of Paulo Vitor Domita Rosa. We're going to be back right after these messages. Outfit your Magic collection with the newest Battle for Zendikar accessories from Ultra Pro. You can see the full array of card sleeves, deck boxes, play mats, and portfolios in your favorite Magic artwork at ultrapro.com. Qualify for the next Pro Tour on Magic Online. Go 5-0 or 4-1 in one of 10 preliminaries to advance to the finals. You can see the full schedule at mtgo.com. Welcome back to the feature match area here in Mir Milwaukee. We have a truly epic battle here between these two titans of the game. And uh, we get a chance now to get inside their head about what their sideboard plans are. Let's hear from Paulo and then John. All right, PV, tell me what the plan is here after game one. Okay, so normally against Jeskai decks, uh, our plan is to take out the combo and bring in a bunch of removal spells, raining volleys, uh, fury impulses, and whirling outbursts. Because then you can actually go the long game to have a bunch of search for thought threats or search brightness. That's what it's called, the uh, removal an attacking creature. So you don't want to be all in on the combo, you want more resilient threats. Uh, they don't have that surge. Instead, they have Colgan's Command and Tazigur, which I think make the long game better for them. So we figured that the best way for me to beat them post board is probably just going like full on combo. So I'm not gonna take out Titan Stream, not gonna take out Timur Battle Rage. I'm gonna actually take out Harling Outburst and bring in Chandra. So, which is a card that is likely to die, but if it doesn't die, it can win the game by itself. Uh, so the plan is to bring in three Chandras, three Raining Volleys, uh, one Roast, and one Fury Impulse, and take out two Lightning Berserkers, uh, all the Wild Slashes, and then, um, I can take out one Titan Strength, I can take out one Timur Better Age, I don't have to do either. It really depends on the number of Fury Impulses that I actually want. I think I only want three Fury Impulses, so I think that's fine. Just take out the Outburst, the Berserkers, and the Wild Slashes. That's probably what I'm going to do. All right, PV, good luck the rest of the way in the top eight. All right, John, looking at your sideboard here, what's the plan after game one uh, in this matchup? Yeah, so I'm going to bring in the, uh, the three Disdainful Strokes the two Exert Influences. No, I'm going to bring in the uh, three Irish and Clerics uh, and the two Radiant Flames. Um, you know, Duress is a card that maybe, th there's some little bit of disagreement. Owen thinks maybe it's a little better than Dispel, uh, or maybe you have both. Um, I, I think it messes up the mana a little bit too much early on. Um, so I'm just going to bring in those, those five, the Irish and Clerics and the Radiant Flames. And then what do you take out to make room for them? Uh, I'm going to take out the, 
Dragon Master Outcast, The Utter End, The Sarkin, and two Crackling Dooms. The Crackling Dooms, actually, I had to wait to see his deck list because sometimes they'll have, like, Hooting Mandrels or a uh, uh, big Dragon Flyer guy that 4-4 four, four Thunderbreak Regent. Um, and the Crackling Doom isn't really, like, that much worse than the other removal. Uh, but since he doesn't have any of that, I'm going out to two Crackling Dooms. All right. Good games the rest of the way in the top eight. All right. Thank you. And once again, welcome back to the feature match area here at Pro Tour Battle for Zendikar. We are in the, we're heading into the second game here of our second quarterfinal match. It's going to be an awesome day for Magic fans around the world. And uh, this is one of the early highlights of the day for sure. Paulo Vitor Damodorosa versus John Finkel. Now, interesting sideboard stuff there from those guys. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we saw that, that Paulo said, well, normally you try to go wide against a deck like this and kind of take away their ability to interact with your combo that you were describing uh, at the tail end of, of game one there, Ian. But it turns out that Surge of Righteousness is a card that, that they don't have. So Paulo actually goes all in on the combo and just says, ah, we're just doing it. Yeah, I really like that plan. Uh, it makes a lot of sense to me. I particularly like bringing in the Chandra, Fire of Kaladesh, um, as just sort of playing into that all-in plan. Like, yes, the Jeskai deck has a lot of cheap removal in the form of Fiery Impulse and things like Crackling Doom, um, but th it's hard to beat the Jeskai deck in a long game, especially with cards like Radiant Flames and Soulfire Grandmaster that we saw in the Swiss yesterday. Uh, I just don't think it's realistic for Paulo to try to win a game on turn 10. Right? He needs to try to win a game on turn five. Uh, so just upping his chances of putting together a really, really powerful draw, hoping John Finkel stumbles a little bit or just doesn't have the right answer at the right time or doesn't have enough answers, that is by far his guess best game plan. Yeah, Paulo said he's actually taking out those Hordling Outbursts. So, you know, mm -hmm. he's, he's actually playing around the, the Radiant Flames a little bit. Now, unfortunately for Paulo, we saw him mulligan in game one. He's had to mulligan again here in game two. Yeah, that is unfortunate for sure, although uh, he's still on the play here, which is where the red deck wants to be. And a mulligan, I think, you know, a little bit less punishing for a red aggressive deck, especially one that's capable of being explosive and winning the game with just a couple cards. I mean, a single Monastery Swiss Spear, Become Immense, and Teamer Battle Rage can win the game all by itself with just a couple lands. Yeah, the, the good news for Paulo there was that it was an easy decision. The bad news is that it was because he had no lands in hand. So, so going down to going five. Going down to now. five, yeah. yeah. So it's a tough spot here for Paulo. Finds himself post-board against John Finkel down a game. Now going down to five cards. This is gonna this is gonna be a tough hill to climb now for Paulo. He is gonna need to see a very specific set of cards to get him there. Mm -hmm. And he's gonna have to hope that the hand that John Finkel kept was kind of one of those, you know, in-betweeners. Well we can take a little little preview of John's hand. It looks like he's got actually a five land hand, which yeah, maybe not so great, but th the two non land cards he does have are Erishan Cleric and Mantis Rider. So those are two great cards in this matchup. But it's entirely possible that, you know, John just draws some land. Uh, notably absent from his hand is a removal spell. And that could open the door for Paulo to really chain something together. Okay, Paulo did keep, and I believe he scried to the top there as well. And play is underway in game two. Can Paulo pull this game out to force a game three here? Second land for Paulo, that's huge. And he has Abbot of Carroll Keep, so he can he can get things going here. Abbot of Carroll Keep, uh, you know, somewhat recent addition, and uh, does a really nice job of giving this type of deck a little more card advantage than it would normally have. Here is Erish and Cleric now on turn two from John Finkel with no play yet for Paulo. Note that Paulo didn't play the Abbot of Carroll Keep on turn two. He wants to maximize his chances of getting value out of it by waiting until... Uh, turn three when he could play a land off of the Abbot if he hits it. Yeah, you can see it, Abbot there from Origins. We saw it have a really breakout run at the Pro Tour last time, and it has been a staple in red since. So Paulo not threatening any immediate early aggression, um, but as we talked about, John Finkel's hand is pretty land heavy. He will have a Mantis Rider to follow up next turn, but beyond that, I think he only has lands in his hand. So if uh, Paulo can kind of settle in for a little bit of a longer game, even though that, that's not his A plan here, um, he actually does have a lot more action going on than John does. So it looks like John 
is still on plan A here of turn two Erish and Cleric, turn three Mantis Rider, and doesn't have much else going on in his hand. I, I think he's just got all lands, Ian. Wow. So this, Yeah, look at that. This is the way that, that Paulo can get into this game here. Um, and pa Paulo's hand is pretty stacked. He's got Atarka's Command. He's got Fiery Impulse, Teamer Battle Rage, Titan Strength. All these cards are, are great uh, in terms of getting in damage, and they're fantastic with the prowess on Abbot of Carol Keep. So we can easily see an attack here. Monastery Swift Spear joins the team here, and in they both come. And this one red mana representing a Titan Strength or a Fiery Impulse. And Paulo's not going to cast anything here. I mean, he could go for Titan Strength for an additional five damage and a scry. But by holding that back, it allows him to, to keep attacking. You know, once he's, he's cast his spells, um, he's no longer able to attack into John's creatures. Oh. So wisely. How's that for a draw step? Ojutai's command. command. Yeah. Now, it's a good one. Maybe not amazing here, but he will find value out of that. You know, one of the plays we've seen against these red decks pretty consistently here. Well, what it lets John do cleric. is block with the cleric this turn, yeah. which kind of forces Paulo to, to commit a spell. I, you know, he's just going to actually oh, counter okay. the second Swiss Spear and draw a card. Uh, John is flooding. He knows he needs to find action. So he's just going to manage the board and try to keep as many cards flowing into his hand as possible here. He is blocking now. Paulo can also use a fiery impulse here to finish off the Erish and Cleric and keep his Swift Spear alive. Would get him an additional damage from the unblocked Abbot. So he's got a few options, and you can see he's thinking about them carefully. Fiery impulse spell mastery is not active, so it's only worth two damage. So, which is enough okay. in this case. So there we go. That's three damage to drop Finkel down to 16, and the Swift Spear plus the Fiery Impulse get over the, uh, the Cleric to put it in the yard. Now what's going on in Finkel's hand here? He's found a Wild Slash and a land. He just cannot seem to find spells here. Wild Slash is a nice pickup, though. Mm -hmm. yeah. Meanwhile, by the way, Ian, let's not lose track of things here. That Manus Rider is doing serious work in the air. Oh, yeah. Paulo's down to nine. Yeah. And that just really showcases the, the ability of this Jeskai deck to close out the game quickly. Puts a lot of pressure on Paulo to put something together quickly. So Paulo still has that Titan Strength. Um, unfortunately, all his other spells cost two, and he isn't able to cast Tarka's Command. He was forced to fetch up a mountain with his second fetch land there, or second land. Yeah, he had that wooded foothills, but... I mean, he could have gotten forest there, but he, he did want to reserve the option to cast two one-mana red spells in the same turn. At the time, he had, uh, I think, three one-mana red spells. So it made a lot of sense for him to fetch up mountain there, but now you know he's really wishing he had access to green mana for those Atarkas commands. Uh-oh. That's a second Manus Rider off the top here for Finkel. Wow. And that means that this is going to be a two-turn clock. It's a two-turn two, two turn clock even through a removal spell. Right. And, and John can safely block with one or both Mantis Riders next turn uh, and still have lethal. Almost, yeah, Paulo's down to three, and we could be at the end of a very quick match. That's and it. that's it. John Finkel advances to the semis. He can only throw his hands in the air. He didn't have a great draw there, but Manus Rider did the job against Paulo Vitor Domitorosa, who was on five cards. He mulliganed yep. to six in the previous, and that's going to do it. John Finkel moves one step closer to Pro Tour victory here. So the great thing about these two Titans clashing early on is one of them wins, and we get to see that player play even more magic throughout the day. So I can't wait to see how, how John's next match works. Yeah, I, I know all eyes are going to be on John Finkel as we move throughout the course of the day here. Welcome back to the booth here in Milwaukee. It's been a great morning. This is oh, only yeah. the beginning. Those are two of our quarterfinal matches. We have two more quarterfinal matches to bring you this morning. Then we're going to watch both semis and, of course, a best-of-five finals uh, before we crown a champion here at Pro Tour 
battle for Zendikar. So uh, great start to the day, Ian. Absolutely. I can't wait to see what's coming next. All right. Let's send it back to the news desk and Richard Hagen to help outline exactly what is coming next. We can certainly do that for you, Marshall. Thanks very much for the story of Palomita Dama Rosa against John Finkel. Uh, Luis, we love the game because in the end, it isn't played on paper, it's played with the cards, and sometimes it's just 2-0 and it's routine and you move on and it doesn't matter who you're playing. Yeah, that match did not last very long. No. It, game two was closer than maybe it had looked just because John drew land after land after land, but Paulo just never had a green source, couldn't cast a bunch of cards in his hand, and eventually, you know, he, he started the game by mulling to five. Right. Uh, so there, we, there you have it. John Finkel, at 37 years of age, is through to the semifinals. Why don't we take a look at our bracket? We are halfway through the morning of quarterfinal action for you. So let's show you what we've had already. We began down at the bottom of the bracket with Ricky Chin in his first pro tour from Canada up against the World Magic Cup qualifier winner from Japan, Ryoichi Tamada, and it was Tamada who advanced by two to one in a tremendous match of magic. It was spectacular. Then we had John Finkel with his 15 Pro Tour top eights up against Paolo Vita Dama de Rosa with his 10, and it was John Finkel by two to zero who made it through. So this afternoon, we will see Jess Guy from Japan, uh, from Ryoichi Tamada, up against Dark Jess guy for John Finkel. So if you want to know whether three or more colors is the correct answer, you're going to get some anecdotal evidence on one of the biggest stages of all. But we still have two quarterfinals to work our way through. And from the 37-year-old Finkel, we turn our attention to someone less than half his age, the 18-year-old wonderkin from Denmark, Martin Muller. Let's take a look at his profile now, this 18-year-old from Denmark, who's kind of swept all before him uh, in the last year or so. Martin Muller, as I say, from Denmark, Yilinga, I've probably hideously mispronounced <laughs> his home city, but we'll give it a, a whirl for you. Martin Muller, let's take a look for you. There we are, 18, a silver pro, and thereby hangs a tail. Poor guy. Ended up, had a tremendous season, but didn't play in the first Pro Tour of last season. He just wasn't qualified at that point. Had a tremendous run and ended up one point short of gold. Finished sixth in the World Championship just a few short weeks ago in Seattle. Already almost 30000 US dollars in earnings, at least 10000 more coming his way for today's work. This is his first Pro Tour top eight, and he is the reigning champion, as it were, of the World Magic Cup in 2014. And we'll be back with Team Denmark in 2015. Let's take a look at what he's playing for you. He is playing a Jeskai tokens deck. Now, we've already seen Jeskai in action, those colors. Luis, work us through. What is Jeskai tokens all about? It's a deck after my own heart. I uh, tried to get it to work for this Pro Tour, didn't quite, but uh, th this team actually did make a very good list. It's based around uh, Jeskai Ascendancy, which makes it so basically all of your cards not only cantrip, they draw you a card and then you get to discard, you also give your whole team plus one plus one. And a lot of your creatures are actually spells. You have Hordling Outbursts and Dragon Fighters and the like. So it just tries to flood the board. Gideon's a key part of it because his emblem is so powerful in this deck. And of course, it gets to use Jace and Cheap Removal, which is a very good recipe. All right. Now, Jeskai Ascendancy, that's a card that is synonymous with an entire deck archetype all of its own. Um, in multiple formats, one with more success than, than others, arguably. Um, to what extent is, is this a is there a combo feel to this deck? We talked about Paolo's deck, and we didn't really get to see that uh, right. in the in his quarterfinal. But there was a very definite feel of, okay, I'm putting part A together, which is a creature in play, and now here's my combo become immense and team a battle rage. To what extent is the Jeskai Ascendancy? comboing for Martin Muller here. So it can play normal games where it goes, you know, Wild Slash, Silk Wrap, Jace, that sort of thing. But the combo part comes when you've got a Jeskai Ascendancy out, you will get to untap with it. You've got some tokens and you go, Dragon Fighter, draw a discard. Wild Slash, draw a discard. Treasure Cruise for one mana. Treasure Cruise is like at its oh. best in this deck. And wow. it's already a great card. And then all of a sudden you've got three five five tokens out. You hit your opponent for 15 and you end the turn with seven cards in your hand. That yeah, sounds pretty good. That <laughs> sounded absolutely <laughs> filthy. All right, great stuff. Um, so uh, we're going to send you across the studio because uh, sitting there waiting patiently is Marshall Sutcliffe, fresh from the booth, uh, and he has with him a very special and potentially very clean guest. Well, you, you'll see what we mean. Here's Marshall. 
Thank you, Rich. Welcome over to the uh, easy chairs here. I've got Simon Nielsen with me. Simon, welcome. Are you comfortable? You look comfortable. Oh, yeah. This is a This nice is great. Place. I met you at the GP in Madison, and now here we find ourselves chatting. Now, I wanted to get you, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Martin. Yep. What was the testing like last night? How's he doing? The testing last night? Uh, yeah, so we basically just, um, we were like the four people, uh, Martin Danger, Larson, uh, me and Martin. Who uh, played some matchups? Uh, to, who played some games uh, against the absent aggro deck that he's going to face now, and also the Jessica Black deck because there are two of those in the top eight, and there is this different than the one we had in our uh, gauntlet when we tested before the Roto. And how were you guys feeling um, after getting the testing done about the matchup? Like in the absent aggro matchup, yeah. it's not looking too good. It's a tough uh, matchup. Yeah, I think it's actually like one of the toughest. Um, it's uh, it was initially pretty close in uh, our own testing, but. Uh, um, his opponent here has more relevant cyborg cards, like more discard spells, which are really good in the matchup. And how was Martin feeling? You know, uh, what was his demeanor? Is, is, is he nervous? He, he doesn't ever really seem to get nervous. Is he pretty cool? He's, he's cool. He's super yeah, cool, right? he's confident. Now, I don't know why. I'm supposed to ask you about a bathtub in yeah. your room? Yes. Yeah, so What's up with the bathtub? So, um, so me and Martin uh, were sharing a queen-size bed okay. for uh, the weekend here. And last night he did not sleep very well because he did not have much space to sleep on and he's not sleeping very well uh, um, normally anyway. So um, so Saturday morning he asked me, Simon, uh, if I make the top eight, can you sleep in the bathtub so that I can get a good <laughs> night's sleep? And I was like, yeah, sure, I can do that. Oh, <laughs> that was no. like pretty risky play because he was X and one at that point. But yeah, <laughs> well, here we are. So. And you did? Did you sleep yeah, in the bathtub? I, I did. I had to make it comfortable with some pillows and some blankets. How are you feeling? Uh, a bit... Uh, a little, little <laughs> stiff? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but you took one from the team. That is some hardcore teamwork, Simon. Good for you. If uh, if he makes it on, you could you get to take most of the credit, I think, uh, <laughs> at least within the testing group. Simon, yes. thanks for taking the time to let us know about your bathtub story. Let's send it back over to the news desk with Rich. If anyone tells you, can you do X? If I do Y, <laughs> say no, 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 no. That's the message. So uh, Simon Nielsen out of the bathtub, into the uh, out of the frying pan, into the fire a little bit. Sounds like Martin Muller may be uh, up against a tough matchup. Let's look at his opponent now, Kazuyuki Takemura of Japan. Let's take a look at his player profile. There he is, 31. He is super happy to be here in this top eight. It is his first uh, Pro Tour top eight, close to $5,000 in earnings, 34 lifetime pro points. Silver Pro, remember, if he runs the table here, he will gain platinum status automatically. That gets him all the invites, all the great benefits of being at the highest tier of Magic the Gathering's Pro <coughs> Club. And that's not just for all of this season, but all of next as well. This is the first event of the Pro Tour season, and that means winning this one is a huge passport to the world of professional Magic the Gathering. So that's Kazuyuki Takemura. Let's see what he has brought to the party. What are his 60 cards? Well, it's a word we are very definitely familiar with, Luis. It's Abzan. Walk us through this deck. Well, the, the rumors of Abzan's demise are greatly exaggerated mm. here. <laughs> right. We haven't seen as many Siege Rhinos this weekend as last uh, past Pro Tours, but this is still a Siege Rhino deck. It's got Onofenza, Den Protector, Hangar Backwalker, Siege Rhino, and Warden of the First Tree, which we see popping up all over. This is basically like the Green-White Megamorph deck, but it splashes black for more removal, especially in the form of Obzon Charm, which is a fantastic card, and of course, Siege Rhino. Mm -hmm. So why do you think we haven't seen as, as many Siege Rhinos as we might have done at this Pro Tour? Uh, the biggest by far is that Thoughtseize is no longer in the format. Without Thoughtseize, the Obzon decks got quite a bit worse. and. It just made it a lot more you know, realistic to play green-white because you're not giving up as much. Okay, so in terms of, uh, for people, I know a lot of people will have seen Abzandex in, in action because it hasn't changed an absolute time. We've got four Gideon ally of Zendikar. That's right. one of the big headlines from uh, BFC. But what kind of play patterns are we looking for? If, we, if we're rooting for Kazuyuki Takamura, what are we looking to see him do in the early game? Is he gonna be on the front foot in this matchup or is he the, the control of the two players? Uh, Takimura wants to be the beatdown here because being the control deck against a deck with four treasure crews is kind of a dicey proposition. And Takimura does have bigger creatures earlier. You know, Onofenza and Siege Rhino just attack for a lot of damage. Right. So his goal, I believe, is going to be to attack. It's also really hard to control tokens with one for one removal. It's one of the strengths of the token deck. Hoarding Outburst does a pretty good job against Murderous Cut. 
Really does. All right, so let's see whether Kazuyuki Takimura can be the beatdown. Let's see whether Martin Muller's good night's sleep was enough to help him with what looks like a tricky matchup. It's time for Jeskai Tokens against Abzan. It's time for quarterfinal three here at PT BFC.